All right. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Vermont House Judiciary Committee on January, Friday, January 28th. And we are continuing our discussion on H 546 and act relating to racial justice statistics. And we are um, joined by our um, legislative counsel, Eric Fitzpatrick, uh, that will walk us through um, a proposed amendment, draft 1.1. H546, timestamp 1107. And uh, that could be found on our committee website. And with that, uh, welcome. Good afternoon, Eric. Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, so I, I, if I'm following you right, first thing you want to do is walk through the new draft. Is that right? Um, that's my understanding, but I will turn to yes. Coach Martin, is that good? Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Please. Great. Sure, and I'll focus on the changes between uh, this committee amendment, which is drafted as a strike all amendment to, to the bill as introduced, and the changes are identified with yellow highlighting, so you should be able to um, see them pretty easily. I'll, I'll share the screen quickly and... Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, Amber, can I be a host, please? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and as I, as I mentioned, this is a, a proposed uh, strike all amendment to, uh, um, to the bill as introduced and the uh, changes are highlighted. So I'll focus on where the, the changes have been made between the bill as introduced and, and the amendment that you're looking at right now. So no changes to the first section about the um, executive director of racial equity that remains as it was. And then you have the second sub chapter uh, within that uh, chapter, which the uh, executive director is in. And this establishes, this first section 5011 establishes and creates the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, and this remains uh, the same as it was when the bill was introduced. And you move on to the duties of the division, and these are itemized um, in great detail, as you remember. You'll see that one change here is that uh, as introduced, there was a language that required the division to make recommendations for designing and implementing interfaces and other technology solutions to address the needs identified in the Justice Technology St Strategic Plan. Now the division up above is required to do to create, or sorry, there it is, subdivision five, <laughs> developing the Justice Strategic Plan is part of one of the duties of the division. But this language is struck here uh, because the Agency of Digital Services indicated that th they're trying to establish a uniformity in uh, the interfaces and technology solutions, things of this nature, and it's their responsibility to do that and that um, having the, the division be making separate uh, recommendations on that score would kind of undercut and, and run at cross purposes with the consistency and uniformity that the that ADS is looking for. So based on, on that proposal, uh, the language is struck. The, um, this is just a, some technical change to change subdivision nine to subsection B just really for technical reasons. And this is the reporting um, requirement. So uh, remember the division has to report every January starting next January to the Judiciary and Government Operations Committee. So the substance of that remains the same. It's just some technical changes there. But subsection B is struck and that's, you'll see the issue of rulemaking. And that's what this involves. And, uh, the committee discussed this at, at length and came to the conclusion that uh, the division would be establishing its, uh, its various um, procedures and guidance via um, uh, its own internal policies and, and policies rather than going through the formal rulemaking process under the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act. And because the committee made that decision, you'll see in a couple of places that references to rulemaking are struck, and this is one of them. So 
won't be any rulemaking, any formal rulemaking. It won't be subject to the, the time constraints that sometimes apply if, when you're going through that formal process. So now we move on to the section relating to data governance. Sorry, did somebody inter ask a question there? Nope. Not Must here. Folks on Zoom, but not here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Could have been an auditory hallucination on my part. So <laughs> the uh, uh, this you'll see. So this is moving on to the data governance piece of what the division does. Uh, you'll see. In the first subsection, subsection A there, lines 12 to 15, is two different things going on. The second one, line 14, is what I just mentioned. You say, this is the division establishing what data is to be collected to carry out its duties. Now, you remember in the bill you looked at last year, for example, that data was uh, uh, expressly and at length delineated, and that was based on, on the report that RDAP had done. Um, but here, the the approach taken is to have the division, you know, on the basis of that report and any other input it gets, you'll see lines 12 to 14, it's gonna be consulting um, with RDAP and with the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council. So in consultation um, uh, with those two bodies, division establishes what data it's gonna be collected. Now the words by rule are struck because as I just mentioned, it's not, not gonna be going through the formal rulemaking process. And just to skip ahead for a moment, so you can see, keeping in mind for a second, the, the in consultation with RDAP and the advisory council piece of that, you'll see that is not necessarily new, it's just moved. See, in the previous draft, it appeared here on page six, uh, lines three through six, it was set out as a separate, um, a separate uh, duty of the division. See, it ha shall consult with RDAP and, and the council when establishing which data to be collected. So all it does, it consolidates that basically. It sort of reads better, I think, to just move it up to the beginning and make clear right here, it's in consultation with those bodies that the division establishes the data to be collected and not by rule. Uh, now we're moving on to an issue that has been discussed in, in committee at some length, and this is the public records issue. Um, I had a chance to speak uh, at length with Tucker Anderson, our public records Council about this and how to how to draft this to to reflect the committee's intent here, which, as you see, is to is to take a different uh, approach. The language that is struck and the approach that was taken in the bill as it was introduced was to specifically say right out front that data uh, that's collected pursuant to the to the to the subject or to the date to the division's mission are not public records subject to. Um, uh, public records law, which we call the PRA, the Public Records Act, and that the data shall be governed, the release shall be governed exclusively by da data sharing agreements or MOUs. So you see that policy, uh, the, the policy embodied in that language was one that, the, that there was going to be essentially an exemption, that, that all data collected pursuant to the, the division's duties and responsibilities are not going to be public records. That means they will not be able to be obtained by the public through public records requests and they would remain confidential. <clears throat> After discussion, this proposal takes a different approach and, and on the, on the uh, actually the opposite approach <laughs> and, and is basically saying, well, it's not going to be uh, making confidential all the records that are collected. It's just going to sort of preserve the status quo. And in other words, uh, and you look at the first sentence, first couple of sentences, uh, we'll say that, uh, make that clear. So the first new sentence starting on line 19 there provides that any data or record, records transmitted to or obtained by the division that are exempt from public records and expect inspection, that means they are exempt from the Public Records Act under existing law, uh, shall remain exempt and shall be kept confidential to the extent required by law. So that just means the existing law with respect to whatever records that the division collects remains the existing law unchanged. So if it's subject to a public records exemption under the existing law by the agency that collects it, whether it's you know, a Department of Public Safety, a Sheriff's Department, a, a, you know, a state's attorney's office, whatever it may be. Uh, uh, Eric, yeah. uh, we have a, que a question from Representative Colburn. Oh, thank you. On an earlier section, so Eric, why don't you why don't you finish here and when the time is right, I can ask, but I don't want to interrupt you mid thought here or the committee. 
Okay, sure. Either way is fine. You want me to just finish up this little piece then and then come back to it? Yeah, or... if that's okay. That sure. Means, that'll, that'll help. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the first point that um, existing law applies to the documents that the division collects and the records and data that the division collects. So uh, they aren't going to be made confidential if they aren't confidential uh, in the first place. <clears throat> If they are if they are public under under the um, law as it applies to the agency that has them, then they'll remain public. If they're confidential, based on uh, uh, how they're treated by the agency that has the data, then it then they stay confidential either way, unchanged by what the division does to it. And then there's some clarification here. The second sentence you'll see also makes clear uh, that. But whatever state or local agency or department that transmits the data to the division will be the sole custodian for purposes of responding to requests for the data or records. And the division shall direct any requests for these data or records to the transmitting agency or department for response. This was a suggestion from Tucker. He's put that in other legislation and other bills as well to make clear that, you know, that the division isn't going to be the one who has to respond to every public records request that comes in. If the record being requested was really something that came from somewhere else, then then it's the originating agency, whoever that may be, who should be the one who responds to the PRA request, which, as the committee knows, can be a very labor intensive process that takes a lot of a lot of hours uh, on the part of staff. And rather than saddling the division with that, um, when it wasn't their record in the first place, it came from somewhere else, then the division will just direct the request back to whoever sent it to them and say, you know, submit it to them, it's, it's their record. Um, so that's the idea, that's the new proposal here. Uh, the, the, that would leave, uh, you know, that this language applies to any uh, data and records that the, that the division collects from other agencies, which of course is one of its, one of its missions to, to gather this data. Um, another, the other set of data that, that they would have is, um, you know, data that the division has collected by, or sorry, not collected, created uh, as it analyzes the data that comes in, as it creates, uh, you know, um, compilations and and conclusions on the basis of that data. Uh, that original work product of the division, as opposed to work product collected from somebody else. That, re that again, nothing is said about that in terms of it being confidential. It isn't necessarily, it's just gonna be applied, uh, sorry, subject to the Public Records Act as it stands. So the same way any other state agency is subject to the Public Records Act, there are some exemptions if, that are in law. If the exemptions don't apply, then the record is public. And that would apply to the division just as much as it would apply to any other state agency. It's, there's no special exemption being created as there was in the bill as introduced. It'll just be, um, you know, treated as any other uh, public records request would be treated by any other state agency, which means that under state law, they have to have a designated records officer who looks at the request, decides whether an exemption applies, and if one does, they can assert it. If it doesn't, then they release the, release the record to the requester. So that's obviously a different approach than, than the one that was in the bills introduced, but as I say, consulting with Tucker and with Representative Lalonde about how to craft this language, um, it, you can see the, the intent of it. And uh, hopefully that's consistent with what the committee wants to do now, but that's up to you. So that's the end of that little piece. I can now pause for a moment. So Representative Coburn can ask the question she had. Yeah, my question, oh, sorry, Maxine. I was, I was thinking Eric and gonna say, go ahead. <laughs> You. Okay, my question is in the same section, um, but the previous page, the right. Um, the right subsection A of this data governance section. I really appreciate the addition of the um, RDAP consultation here, but I am trying to remember I guess I'm trying to understand a little bit more where, and I'm sure the answer lies in some of our previous testimony, where the decision to remove the rulemaking process came from. And my, I mean, 
it seems to me it's not the most nimble process certainly but it you know a rulemaking process is necessitates a fair amount of public input and so it seems to me that it would allow more comprehensive stake at least in theory stakeholder and community input into this question of what what data is being collected and i'm just thinking back to a meeting i had with folks from the policing project earlier in the week on a different topic but they have this is a national group that looks at policing issues that has a data and transparency model some model legislation and they were saying that in their work they feel like that question of which data gets collected is really really critical um to being able to use the data well and not have it be discredited and so yeah i just i you know, I think there was some committee discussion here maybe, but I also just want to understand if folks can help me remember where the decision to remove it from rulemaking came from and, and what feedback kind of drove that is driving this change. That would be super helpful. Well, if, if I may, um, sure. as, as you see, we have two express um, Lee noted um, governance groups that are involved in that data selection component. If you look at it, it one is RDAP and the other one is the um, Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council itself. If you look at the makeup of those two councils, they are ex just, they're very diverse, uh, not only in their composition uh, of uh, related specialists, but also in the affected communities groupings that are also associated within the membership of both of those entities. And, and that was done very intentionally. And as you might recall, we even expanded RDAP uh, last session, uh, the first half of the biennium to include even more community members and uh, the racial, the office of racial equity as well in RDAP itself. Mm -hmm. so, so we've really tried to ensure that our community voice is large. <laughs> I guess that's the, the best way to put it. Um, Martin, would you like to add yeah. to that? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, I would. So what we're trying to balance, uh, I think, is allowing this uh, division to be nimble, to be able to uh, be more responsive as far as what data it needs to try to get if it runs into issues, et cetera. And certainly rulemaking uh, is, is less nimble. It's, it's be certainly better perhaps than, than the legislative process as far as the, uh, how efficient it is and how quick it might be, but it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't give the flexibility certainly as much to uh, as as a policy making. Uh, so that's on the one hand, but on the other, just what what uh, coach is saying as far as we have these two bodies that are very diverse and representing uh, the entities or the the organizations, the individuals uh, who really is uh, affected by by or or is part of the criminal justice uh, system. So, and I would just also add that the, the RDAP and presumably also the advisory panel, uh, they, they meet in public. I know that RDAP welcomes public input. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's opportunity for individuals <clears throat> not members of those uh, panels to, to weigh in if, if they so desire. So there is that transparency uh, as well. So that's kind of the balancing that's going on here uh, that 
and this is this is a question that I did ask all pretty much all the witnesses. And I think we pretty uniformly were hearing a preference to go this route uh, than than the rulemaking. So that's that's why we arrived here. Yeah, I guess I would just say that. Well, I'll, I'll save for committee discussion. I just, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll hold off for now. But thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate that explanation. Bob has a question. Yeah, uh, I don't know who I should address this to. Under the public records request, FOIA request, whatever we want to refer to it as, uh, I guess I I need a little explanation as far as if, if in fact, I'm, I'm assuming that all of these entities are going to be sending uh, whatever they have, or whatever is requested through the advisory. Uh, I forget what we're calling it. Or they're probably the division. The data division. Yeah. And, and, and if the division is what, they're going to come up with a total of, of many different things. And so for you or for us to say that uh, if someone requests under the Public Records Act or through a FOIA request, certain information that they've just put all together. How are they going to identify which agency to direct them to? Because I wouldn't want to be overwhelmed with requests from something that, oh, wait a minute, we, we, we didn't send that to them. I mean, how is that going to work? I guess I'm concerned about, we don't want to overburden the division with, with uh, so how do we not overburden uh, certain departments and offices throughout the state that may not have nothing to do with it? How, how do we flag that? I'm not a computer guy, so I'm asking. Um, I'm not either. Maybe Coach uh, has an idea, or we might have to ask, uh, find another witness to answer such a question. I don't know. Well, if they're confidential, they're confidential. I, I can appreciate that. But for those records that aren't, and they call me up and say, we want this here. Oh, we need to contact uh, okay. Officer Lalonde because he's the one who sent it. How are they going to flag that? Let's not waste other agencies' uh, time either, because it is a, a burdensome thing, shall we say. Right. Well, pr presumably... Uh, however they set up the system, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, that they will, they will be able to determine where they've gotten certain, certain kinds of data. I mean, there's law enforcement data, there's state's attorney's data, there's defender's data, there's court data, et cetera. So, you know, maybe it comes in and just asks for all the information about one person's name. Presumably, this the division just turns around and sends it to all the information officers of of the five or six different entities that may have provided something. Yeah, may have provided something. This seems to be somewhat potentially burdensome on, yeah. if we can't identify where it came from, I think at least, the very least, the divisions have the responsibility to say, okay, let's flag us where the information came from so they don't overburden these other agencies. Who, they got other things to do too, I mean, true. as far as responding to public records requests. It's all true. Report. That, that's my concern there. It's just, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I don't have a, a good answer for you. That's kind of in the technical realm and hopefully uh, is figured out by the information officers of these different entities. Um, unless, Coach, unless you have more information on that than I have. If you aren't talking, you're muted because we can't hear you. <laughs> no, I, I was going to uh, ask uh, Eric to continue. Um, and then we can come uh, come back because I think I'd like to hear from some of our RDAP uh, members, um, you know, about their thoughts. And and maybe this might not be a bad time to maybe ask quickly uh, if either Evan or Rebecca would be interested in uh, chiming in about the the rulemaking piece uh, question. Evan or Rebecca, would you care to uh, share your thought on on that to help us as we move forward? I'd be happy to share my thoughts. There, there are two of the topics that I was going to address in my testimony, and I know that I was not supposed to testify until later, so I don't want to jump the starting line. But I'm happy to I'm happy to speak now if that's the committee's preference. Uh, I I I would say. Uh, uh, Representative Colburn, do you think that that would be helpful uh, hearing from? Um, I, I feel all set, so I'm happy to let Eric just complete the walkthrough. But if, you know, it's your 
it's up to you, Coach, what you think makes the most sense. <clears throat> okay, then, then Eric, why don't we continue? Uh, and then we'll come back because it seems like they're going to speak to it anyways. Okay, sure. That sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so moving along to the next subdivision here, this also actually relates to uh, the rulemaking issue in the sense that you see that lines two to eight there. This has to do with the um, the interplay between the division and the and the state agencies and departments from which it's going to be collecting this data. <clears throat> As the language was originally drafted, um, the, the way it was set up was that the division shall be granted access to the data of any state or agency or department that it designates by rule. That's line seven. So the way in which uh, the division would uh, collect this data sort of procedurally is step number one is they would designate an, a state agency by rule. And then once it did that, then that agency would uh, have to provide access to the division to, to the data that it was necessary uh, for the division's purposes under this chapter. Now, so given that the, the thought, at least for this draft, obviously it's gonna be an issue that continues to be discussed, but for purposes of this draft, uh, the rulemaking piece was uh, uh, changed to to not be part of the division's process. So this had to be rewritten and you'll see, but it's preserving the, the process of how it is that the division's going to, going to get this data uh, from the relevant state agency. So the way it would read now would be, the division shall identify which state agencies or documents possess the, ne the data necessary for the division to perform its requirements and objectives. So first thing, step one, division identifies uh, the state agencies or departments that have the necessary data uh, related to, to the division's requirements and objectives. Step two uh, is the highlighted sentence, an agency or department identified pursuant to this subdivision. So if you've been identified, shall upon request, provide the division with any data that the division, and you see here, I had two options. I wasn't sure which way to put it. So I just put them both in and figured the committee could discuss it. The idea here is, you know, do you want uh, do you want it to be sort of um, open ended in the sense that the division has you know the discretion that the division can exercise would be uh, that you know if they request it then the agency or department has to provide it that'd be option one number eleven because you could say well they have to provide uh, the division with any data that the division requests period that could be one option or if you want to be uh, a little give a little more guidance to it you could say the second bracketed language. Provide the division with it. With, provide the division with any data that the division determines is relevant to its purpose under section section five five thousand eleven B, which you know I'll just really quickly move up there just so you can recall that. See, it's there's a clear statement there starting on line sixteen of what the mission and purpose of the division is: collecting and analyzing data relating to racial disparities, the intent to center racial equity throughout these efforts, et cetera. I won't read the whole thing, but just the point is that that the purpose is articulated here clearly. Um, so it's really just a question of down here, uh, how much um, you know, discretion you want there to be for the division's determination about requesting um, data. In other words, just if they keep it open-ended or tie it into um, its purpose and say that those are the data that the, that the agency has to provide. Um, so then lastly, that last sentence is unchanged. That's just the, the division's ability to access data for non-state entities. It can do that through um, MOUs or data sharing agreements. So that's that piece. Uh, this next subdivision three has been rewritten um, uh, in response to the suggestion of the state archivist, uh, Tanya Marshall, who uh, I've been emailing and speaking with about this piece. And she, uh, I, I rewrote the language a little bit technically, but this is, and she's approved of this language. She, I ran it by her after I had it done and she gave it the green light. And this has to do with uh, uh, how and with whom the division is gonna work with on collection and retention of data, data governance, uh, those sorts of things. And, and uh, Tanya made the excellent point that um, rather than kind of reinvent the wheel, uh, the best way to do that would be just to, uh, 
uh, loop in existing law as to um, you know, the requirements that already exist with respect to state agencies. And I mentioned this earlier, how state agencies have to have records officers and they have to uh, have records retention policies. Um, you know, we have one in our office. I remember when it was instituted, it had to be run. Those things have to be improved by the state archivist. You know, how long do you have to keep records? When is it okay to delete them? That sort of thing. Every state agency now has to develop these. Um, and, uh, and that is the statute that you see referred to in line 19. So it makes clear that you know, that applies to everybody anyway, no matter what you say here. So it makes sense to, to uh, cross-reference that. So it explicitly says division shall pursuant to that statute that I just mentioned, establish, maintain, and implement an active and continuing management program for its records. So that's, it has to do that anyway, pursuant to that statute, but this makes the duty clear. Um, and so uh, then the second piece of that that in doing this, uh, it has support with support and services provided by the state, Vermont State Archives and Records Administrator pursuant to 3 BSA 117 and the agency digital services pursuant to 3 BSA 3301. Now those statutes also already provide that these two state agencies uh, or two entities, I should say, um, are required to provide uh, the various state actors with this sort of support, with support on information technology, uh, data maintenance, that sort of thing is already laid out explicitly in statute. So again, it was logical to, to um, put that expressly in here for who the division works with and, and under what statute. Uh, so division four, I already mentioned, that's the one that got struck here and moved up to the top regarding the division's consultation with RDAP and the, and the advisory council. Um, no changes to the rest of the data governance issues. Public facing website and dashboard unchanged, that's all the same. Uh, composition of the advisory council, that there are a couple of additions to that based on, I believe that was testimony from Judge Grierson. You'll see it's gone up from 18 to 20 because Judge Grierson recommended two additional members of the council. You see identified subdivisions L and M there, the executive director of the Center for Crime Victim Services, as well as a substance uh, use disorder or mental health treatment provider uh, appointed by the Secretary of Human Services. So those are two more individuals who would be on the advisory council. Uh, no change to, the, to here. Again, some technical changes there, substance use disorder instead of abuse disorder. There has been a little bit of reorganization here just for making the language flow correctly, but no changes in meanings. Uh, the, uh, I think there's some other technical changes here at the end to conform with what I just described. Yeah, so remember, since there's, there were two new members added to the council, um, you had to do some renumbering here to make sure that the, it was referring to the right members who got appointed for the two-year term, the three-year term, and the four-year term. And I think that's it. Yep. Yeah, it looks like that's the, the end of the walkthrough and all the changes that are proposed for this draft. Uh, are there any questions for our attorney? All right. Shall I pull the document down so committee can discuss? Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Eric. You bet. You bet. Great job as always. Uh, Oh, thank you. Make sure I'm uh, in the right spot here. There we go. There we go. Okay, okay. So I, I guess what um, I'd like to do, if we could, um, Madam Chair, we could move into our witnesses. And it seems that I'd, I'd like to start with, uh, 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 with Evan uh, being that uh, part of his uh, testimony is directly related to a representative Colburn's question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Evan Meenan and I work for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I was also the department's uh, designee to the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel and the department did sign off on the report that was submitted to the legislature that RDAP um, prepared. 
Um, the, the bill, um, I think for the most part, this is a really good bill and it, and it adopts uh, many, but not necessarily all of the recommendations from the RDAPS report. Um, so for example, the report identified three potential locations for the Bureau to be housed. And we, uh, the department thinks that the one that was selected in this bill is acceptable. The most important thing from the department's perspective, regardless of where this was housed, was ensuring that the Bureau was provided with adequate staffing and resources, not only to fulfill its own mission, but to provide technical assistance to the entities that are going to be expected to report data to it. When we were having these conversations in RDAP, we had the benefit of technical experts like Karen Gannett and Robin Joy from the Crime Research Group, as well as Wichi Artu, and, and their input was, was very valuable from the department's perspective. Um, in terms of the department's technological capabilities to report data, I have to admit that unfortunately, they're presently very weak. Um, the legislature did appropriate the department some money to obtain a new case management system. And we're, we are in the early stages of acquiring that. I've already flagged uh, both for, for my supervisor and for our own IT folks that we should expect to have to report this type of demographic data out and that we should be mindful of those potential responsibilities as we move forward in, in the case management system acquisition process. Um, so it generally, the department is in, in support of this bill. I do have a couple of specific comments that relate to uh, Representative Colburn's questions and then also some, some of the comments about public records requests. Um, Regarding the issue of rulemaking, um, my comments are going to be influenced somewhat by the fact that I've worked for two state uh, administrative agencies that had rulemaking authority, the Agency of Natural Resources, and most recently the Natural Resources Board, um, where I was the Associate General Counsel. My comments are also gonna be influenced somewhat by my current role as the chair of the rules committee of the Criminal Justice Council. So I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those three entities, but I highlight that um, to illustrate that I do have some experience in the rulemaking process. And based on that experience, I think you could make a reasonable argument that adopting rules is arguably more transparent and provides for more public participation than uh, navigating some of these issues through other mechanisms. I think you could also make an argument that more transparency and more public participation um, are especially good things in this context because part of the Bureau's purpose is to provide uh, more data transparency related to the criminal justice system. There's, there's two provisions of Vermont's Administrative Procedures Act that might be worth considering um, when the committee makes its decision about how it wants to proceed. The first provision is, is section 831. And what it says is that agencies have to adopt rules where due process or a statute directs them to adopt rules and then the second is section 801, which states an agency means any state board, commission, department, agency, or other entity um, authorized by law to make rules or determine contested cases. I don't think there's any expectation that the Bureau is gonna be determining contested cases. So the question of whether or not it's gonna fall within the Administrative Procedures Act may very well depend upon whether or not uh, the legislature grants the Bureau rulemaking authority. Um, so at a minimum, if the committee is not um, thrilled about the idea of requiring the Bureau to adopt rules, it, it may have the option of stating that the Bureau may adopt rules. And that language may adopt rules is, is some language that's used in the enabling legislation for other public bodies. And then with that authority, the Bureau can make a decision. Do we want to address this specific topic through the rulemaking process 
or do we want to adopt it through promulgating procedures, which is also something that's addressed by the Administrative Procedures Act? Regarding public records, um, I am the department's public records officer, which means I'm um, responsible. <laughs> this just Martin. He, <laughs> oh, my apologies. The screen is very small. Calls. I can't see it. I know it's really hard to see, and that's I, I apologize. But before you move on, uh, so would it be just a matter of in? Uh, I'm looking at the redraft page four. Uh, Section 5013A, line 14, of uh, putting by rule back in there and changing the shell to may, is that accomplish what you just suggested? I think it probably would. I, there's, I'm, I was trying to count as, as um, Attorney Fitzpatrick was doing the walkthrough. I think there's probably three or four places where it used to say shall adopt by rule. Um, and there, again, I think, I think I'm pretty confident may adopt rules is used in other enabling legislation. So there's, there's going to be references for legislative council to pull, to pull from, but yes, I think if the shall was changed to may in those three or four locations in order to give the Bureau the flexibility to go through the rulemaking process, if it, if it thought that that was warranted, then it, it would have the ability to do that. Conversely, if it was permissible under the APA to address something through a procedure it could do that as well. Um, so yes, I think that that would be perhaps one way to do it. Or, or perhaps or perhaps just to make clear that it is to come up with uh, the data that it's supposed to carry or that's supposed to collect, it could say something along the lines that the division shall establish uh, <clears throat> rule or otherwise or something like that because we may want to have the shell established but then leave the discretion of whether it's procedure or I mean policy or rule uh, to the agency and I think that Eric can work out exactly how to do that because I think we do want to dictate that the agency the division has to come up with uh, the data that needs to be collected but give them the discretion of how to do it yeah I, I'm confident sense. Eric would, is going to know exactly how to phrase it all right, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Eric, it looks like you... Uh... Well, yeah, I just think that kind of consistent with what both Evan and Representative Lalonde were saying, you only, need to change, you only need to do that in the one place on page four in subsection B, put that language back in, division may adopt rules uh, to carry out its duties. And then in the other places, you don't need to indicate rule, anything about it. You just say division shall do thus and such. And then, then pursuant to the language that we just mentioned, that Evan was pointing out, they would have the discretion to decide, all right, are we gonna do that by rule or are we not? But that, that would sort of be an overarching authority that they would have to make that decision based on the particular piece of information they're talking about. Does that make sense? I think, I think, I think that's, that's right. You know, that's an inequitable, you know, approach. And thank you, uh, Evan, for uh, bringing that, that piece to our, our attention. You know, it, it takes a village to build a good bill. So would you continue, please? A absolutely. Um, so I was going to address the, the public records piece. Um, and, and I think I was saying that I'm the, I'm the department's public records officer, which means I, I, res I don't know if it's a, a punishment or a privilege, but it's my responsibility to respond to pretty much all of the public records that the department receives. Um, and so um, I can represent on on behalf of the department that the, the language that runs from page four, line 19 to, to page five, line five um, is, is good language. And you know, I, I would hope that if there are any entities that are gonna be responsible for reporting data, um, this, might, this might minimize any concerns they might have about whether or not they're providing any, any information they would, they would consider to be sensitive. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that when the department acquires its new case management system, we will really be providing data. We will have the ability to report out data that's going to be important to the Bureau rather than having to burden the Bureau by giving them a bunch of, dumping a bunch of underlying records on them and having them extract the data for themselves. Um, and I think that, that if that process ends up being true, that might minimize some of the concerns that 
that Representative Lalonde was expressing about, you know, creating some sort of arduous burden on on behalf of these reporting entities. You know, what what might end up happening is a member of the public or someone else might see some data and then realize, oh, I want to delve into the underlying documents and then approach the reporting entity with a public records request. But state agencies are pretty well experienced in responding to public records requests, and I don't see that as a, as a bad thing. Um, the only other comment that I think I wanted to make was that, you know, we were glad to see the change on page eight, lines 13 to 14, including the, the Center uh, for Crime Victim Services in the Advisory Council. I think that having victims' perspectives on this is a, is a really good thing. And, you know, um, hopefully we don't discover that there's any racial disparities with regards to how victims are engaged in the criminal justice system. I'd like to think that there aren't any, but that's probably foolish optimism. And hopefully the center, you know, will help flag any issues or ask appropriate research questions to help flush out those things. So that's a really important addition from the department's perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Um, Rebecca Turner, how are you today? Hi, good, thank you. Um, thank you for committee for inviting me back to speak on this uh, latest draft for the record, Rebecca Turner from uh, the Office of the Defender General uh, and also member of the RDAP panel. I'm just going to focus my comments today on, on the new changes that Eric just presented in the walkthrough. And really there are just two points um, that I want to, to, to go to, I guess as a precursor since, since um, uh, Representative Colburn asked the question um, as, to, as to whether or not we, our position or you didn't ask, the ODG's position, but certainly what representatives Lalonde and Christie uh, shared were, were consistent with, with my prior testimony, which um, was that it not having a rulemaking process to determine how and which data to collect would certainly make this new entity more nimble. Um, and also that there are uh, numerous representatives from the public already built into this. So I, 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 am, I am not, opposed to what Evan just suggested in terms of, the, of the, that language change. I would only add that my personal experience working on this panel in terms of, of drafting and coming up with data that should be collected, uh, the three reports that have since been submitted, it's pretty, it was pretty arduous, <laughs> complicated with just uh, that RDAP panel. And so um, certainly getting off the ground for the first year, maybe uh, consider returning to uh, the mandatory rulemaking process uh, subsequent um, and let, let there be sort of maximum flexibility in the first route. But that's, that's um, my only suggestion or thoughts on that. Uh, so, so really I wanted to focus on page two, four and five. And this is in regards to the new language that Eric added in the data governance section 5013. And, um, I'll start with actually, it's A2. A2, there's a line in there that says, um, an agency or department identified pursuant to this subdivision. And presumably the Defender General's office will be included in that list, right? Uh, upon request, provide the division with any data that the division requests. Now, I think, I think unique to the other government agencies and departments that will be asked to provide data, the Defender General's office um, has data that's otherwise privileged or confidential that cannot be disclosed to the division. Um, it's, it's covered by the uh, exemptions in the Public Records Act, in Title I, 217, uh, Section C. And but the way I read this new language on four, 
and sort of this characterization that it preserves the status quo, that if it's exempt under the PRA, the division will honor that, but still collect that information. So I just want to make clear that doesn't actually maintain the status quo. How I read those two sections on four and five together as they apply to the Defender General's office, uh, we would have to disclose any data that the division requests even if it's otherwise uh, deemed confidential or pri privileged under the various uh, statutes, rules, common law that obligates us um, from revealing this information. And again, the reason why the Defender General's Office is unique in this situation is we're more like a law firm, we're representing individuals. Uh, and so we, have, we are prohibited under um, our professional uh, code to reveal information about a client that was acquired during the representation. And um, I think sometimes people collapse that to assuming just information that's confidential or secret, but that duty to not reveal extends to information that may otherwise be public. Uh, again, it is under our professional um, obligations, our duties to not share information acquired during that representation. It's also a for it's, it's a pretty expansive um, confidentiality provision in that it extends not just to current clients but to former clients, as well as uh, uh, prospective clients. So again, I think that I'm concerned that if this language remains as is, the division may think it has the authority to order the Defender General's office to reveal information that that we can't otherwise um, reveal that is actually not uh, subject to reveal under the current PRA. So I'm not sure if if the easy fix is to just reference there explicitly Title I, Section 317C, um, and uh, making sure that the Defender General's Office maybe is not captured with the others. Um, I'm happy to just sort of talk further with, with legislative counsel, Eric, if, if you want to do that or, or not. But that was a significant concern with this latest draft for us. Uh, and then the second point is page seven. And it goes to still within the data governance section. It's relating to subsection D, Delta data retention. And this is actually not new proposed language, but merges with some of the concerns I raised earlier, which was making sure that the language and phrases here is consistent with the Public Records Act. I understand that the term retention has distinct meaning uh, in the Public Records Act. And I also understand that, that the way that page 7, section D, establishes that the division shall recommend uh, standards and practices for the retention of data, again, that suggests that this division has perhaps authority over uh, the state archivist or um, or another entity, but as I understand it, the, the uh, jurisdiction of data retention is laid out clearly in um, Title I, I think is it Title I, Section 317A. And so I understand that there might be a conflict. So it's just maybe tweaking, changing the word retention uh, to make sure it's not inconsistent. Um, yeah, okay. uh, just a quick question, uh, Rebecca. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart Turner. Um, actually, yeah, yeah uh, that's one provision that we just heard from uh, uh, Eric heard from Tanya Marshall of the uh, the archivist just the other day, raising the same point, and we just hadn't uh, been able to get together on trying to figure that out. Uh, I mean, I thought just whether it should be data collection that that the division shall make recommendations regarding the collection of data. Or, or do you have a replacement concept for retention? Retention yeah. is governed elsewhere, but uh, how one collects the data and determining uh, when or in what situations to put uh, different you know, categories down, for instance, yeah, I could see the division doing that, and I don't think that's covered elsewhere, but. Yeah, no, I. I I think that's that's a that's a, a good idea just to drop the word retention um, and limit it to collection. 
um, that that would be fine. So those are those are really my my comments uh, that I had for this latest draft. And I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'll I'll stop here. Well, um, oh. Rebecca, I I really want to thank you uh, and Evan uh, because every time you visit uh, the draft, uh, you add a positive, uh, and that. You know that's gonna make this thing, you know, something that we can all get across the finish line and feel comfortable with. So, thank you so so much. I have another question too, Coach, if I could. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Mr. Turner, if you, if you you could just remind me what um, what the data is. Uh, I know that last year's, or I should say, the 2020 effort of our DAP came up with a list of the high impact, high discretion right. areas. Yeah. What, what kind of uh, data points were identified for the Defender General's office? I'm just curious about that. No, no, thank you. I, I meant to, to um, say that in, the, in my comments on that section. I think the almost the entirety of the data that is that we identified could otherwise be found in the court records and court data and the police records. So, I, so for us to um, to have to provide something that's in addition not otherwise found in these other uh, data uh, port portals. I think that would be um, little, although I, I, I am recalling that, that there was a recommendation in the report that we did not join. Uh, so it's not a consensus point. It was concerning <clears throat> specifically, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, defense attorneys, um, some, some specific data relating to defense attorney practice, uh, the filing of pleadings and such. Again, that's an example where um, you could glean that information, how many motions were filed from court records, right? Um, and, and I think that's, that is where, so I, I, unless Evan can recall something else that's specific to a collection point we identified relating to defense attorneys, um, that's that's what I'm recalling. Again, that would be covered by data kept elsewhere. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. So yeah, I mean, if you have any suggestions on language to take care of that, that makes complete sense, at least to me, uh, that yeah. some of that information is definitely privileged. <clears throat> Representative Lalonde, if, if I might. Sure. Yeah, please. Uh, Ed, Evan Meenan again for the Department of State's Attorneys. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have that list of, of discretion points at, at hand, but you know, I do think perhaps one of the benefits of, of, of uh, permitting the Bureau to go through the Administrative Procedures Act is to allow the, the public and other interested stakeholders to engage in the conversation about what types of information can permissibly be reported by the Defender General's Office. For example, I remember uh, I think some of the the you know some of the information that was discussed was you know the education and experience of of certain practitioners, including defense counsel, and who they end up representing. In other words, do we tend to see some types of defense counsel being assigned to some types of defendants more frequently than others? Um, how frequently are defense counsel having in person conversations versus telephone conversations? with clients viewing evidence in person versus, you know, summarizing evidence in person. And I'm not suggesting that all of these things can be permissibly reported. I think that those are potentially complex questions, but having a process like rulemaking or a procedure promulgation through the APA might be a mechanism to help flush those out and allow members of the public to participate in this kind of conversation. So, you know, I would anticipate there's some data points that the Defender General's office could report out that may not be available from other sources. What those data points are, I think, um, is worth further discussion and, and probably can't be established right now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll continue with our uh, immersion in editing as we move forward. So those are um, all the witnesses we have for today. And then we'll be revisiting this next week. Um, uh, and 
uh, Madam Chair, um, I'll hope to have a um, uh, a visual for the committee to look at, uh, just to show what it looks like from a graphic perspective. Great, thank you. Great. Well, thank you to our witnesses and thank you, Coach and Martin. Um, let's take a, a quick uh, break so we can stay on track. Um, I know some folks have some commitments. So let's, um, let's just take a break and come back at uh, 2.30 for, um, for our next week. Thank you.